When trying to decide what my first video topic would be, I chose to ask all of you lovely people on Twitter. And the results were pretty clear. So I read through the entirety of the Monado archives and I learned quite a bit of interesting information. A number of things I've never even heard about in regards to Xenoblade are located in here. I still highly recommend reading the book for yourself. There's just so much in here that I can't communicate everything in a video to you all. The version that I read for this video is the one located at Xeno Underground that was translated to English by Paradigm, Arico, and the rest of the wonderful translation team. Hey, that's me! Thanks to everyone involved for making this happen. The link to download is in the description if you'd like to read for yourself. I also put the link to their channel in the description. They make really cool Xenoblade content too. But that being said, let's start reading. Xenoblade, The Secret File, Monado Archives had two regional releases. The first was in Japan in November 2010, and the next was in France in August 2011. The French release is especially notable since only 1,000 copies of the book were produced in that language, which makes the French version one of the rarest Xeno collectibles. The book itself is full of information, concept art, and developer insights on the creation of the game. The first few pages, called Evaluation Meeting, contain an interview with Tetsuya Takahashi, Ko Kojima, Genki Yokota, Norihiro Takami, and Yuchiro Takeda. They start off by talking about how they worked on Soma Bringer, a Japan-exclusive DS game, and Disaster Day of Crisis, a Wii game that didn't make it to America. They were actually developing these games at the same time as Xenoblade. Development began for it at about the same time that the Wii launched. Funnily enough, the Wii Remote didn't influence the game's development at all. They just decided not to use it. The decision was made that Xenoblade would be aimed at a more general audience than Monolith was used to. This is probably because of how their development on Xenosaga seemed to tunnel vision on certain concepts, which ended up leading to problems after release. Because of this, one of the goals became to make this a world that the player would love to live in. Takami says that one of his biggest regrets is not being able to make the areas feel more interconnected. He felt that there were too many loading zones. Interestingly enough, this became a selling point for Xenoblade X a few years later. In that game, you could literally walk from any area on the map to another with no loading screen at all. Once development on Disaster Day of Crisis wrapped up, Monolith poured all of their efforts into working on Xenoblade. According to Yokota, they were shooting for a holiday 2009 launch window for the game originally. But as we know, that did not happen. By the time October 2009 had rolled around, the game was still in its debugging phase, so that release window just wasn't going to work. Around this time, playtesters had discovered topple locking, so they implemented spikes as a measure to combat the issue. They described the implementation of spikes as, and I quote, a real mess. I would imagine that was the case because the combat was largely done and they needed to strike a proper balance for the mechanic with what they had already established. Later on, they begin talking about interesting character bits. For instance, Ricky's fish biters exist because a fish was modeled for the Ricky and Dunban scene on the Fallen Arm beach, and they decided to use it for other things too. Ricky also originally had the lowest HP value during development. One day, they randomly decided to max out his HP to see how it would go, and everyone liked it. I honestly cannot imagine playing Ricky with low health, so good on them. They also really like Lenata. A lot. Like, they're really horny for her. That's all well and good, but personally, Lenata's more up my alley. First off, just going by looks, she's totally my type. And then there's the fact that she's a female doctor. Very nice. Nice. Ah, okay, I'm assuming you respect her medical expertise? Nonsense. What can we say? The man has a fetish. And you, Kojima-san, who's your favorite? I'd pick Lenata too, for her medical expertise, of course. No, no, I just love her design from a visual standpoint. If I noticed her earlier, I'd have insisted we make her playable. Good to see that some of the devs are just as horny as the fanbase can be. Takahashi says his favorite character is Mumkar. He likes him a lot because he's just a bad guy. What you see is what you get with him. He's not overly complex. He's evil because he's evil, and he loves it. Something super interesting is how, for a time, they debated on whether or not Fiora should come back, and if she did, how it would happen. Her return is a huge turning point in the narrative that works super well overall, so I definitely think that they treated it with the care that it deserved. What do you guys think? 
Lastly, Kojima thanks us for reading the book because we must be very devoted fans if that's the case. I agree! Only a truly devoted fan would read the English translation posted on Xeno Underground, which I've linked in the description. The Visual Index catalogs all the artwork in the book. I'm not going to put every single one of them on screen, but I will show you some of my favorites. Here's this one of Mumkar that I really like. I just love the line work here. I'm sure most of you have seen this one before. It's the Melia and Fiora swimsuit art that was actually made by a fan for the book. I absolutely adore this one, where they're all dressed up nice for like a party. And there's this one where they're enjoying a nice home-cooked meal like a big dysfunctional family. The book also comes with this poster inserted into it. The other side of the poster has a full affinity chart for the game, with every possible affinity path listed. I personally haven't removed mine since I'm scared I'll mess up and rip it. This next section, titled World Visual, has a few pictures of each area in the game along with a nice description. Pretty cool. Then we have the main character section. On the first page, there's a small affinity chart for the main cast of characters. For most of these characters, there's a page listing their race, sex, age, height, and voice actors, along with some quotes and a bit of background on them. The party members in particular also have their skill tree traits listed here, so that's a nice detail. Starting off here, it says Shulk was born while his parents were researching the Monado, and because of that, he would accompany them on their ventures. I guess what this implies is that there were other Monado expeditions before the final one? Either that, or the ventures described here weren't cool enough to be a part of the expedition itself. Nothing is too relevant about Ryan's page, but I have to point out how it says, He is proud of his hair, robustness, and mighty body. If I were Ryan, I would certainly be proud of my hair too. Ricky's page reveals only Melia can pet him freely because of his special affectionate relationship with her. In the heart-to-heart -heart Flowers of Aerith Sea, it's revealed that he does have a little crush on Melia, so this isn't too surprising. What makes this even funnier though, is that right after this, it says that he is completely obedient to Akka. Mecha Fiora has two pages, one that features art with her helmet that she uses while piloting Nemesis, and one without the helmet for when she joins the party, which I find kind of weird. On the first Mecha Fiora page though, it specifically says that Fiora's body is now 70% mechanical. It's pretty interesting to have a specific percentage put on that in my opinion. Mumkar's page lists him as being a candidate for wielding the Monado. Obviously, this is one of the reasons he grows to hate Dunban, but it's interesting to think about how the Defense Force chose Dunban. Was there a vote? A contest to see who could hold it the longest? Or maybe it was because Dunban had the best hair? I mean, look at those long, flowing locks. Dixon's age is listed as a spry 44. We know he obviously isn't that young, but this is probably the age he was using after he had integrated himself into modern Hom society. Next up we have my boy Alvis, says that he's looking for a new god that he trusts to liberate the world. I like that this book puts his motivations into words because Alvis is just such a mysterious character, it can be hard to explain what he wants. Alvis also lacks an age on his profile, along with some other characters. Alvis, Tyrea, Lorathea, Egil, Venea, Linata, and Maynith all have... Uh. With the exception of Tyrea, everyone here is over thousands of years old at least. We know that Mikol is 6,000 years old from a heart-to-heart -heart between Fiora and Ricky, so the Machina here are likely at least a thousand years younger than that. As for the others, who the heck knows? After the character profile section, there's a group of pages that have the tutorials for each party member. Even Hom's Fiora, which is a nice little detail. After that is a section dedicated to giving every single NPC a profile. That certainly took some major effort. Holy crap, why did they even do this? Next up is the world guide. It lists key terms, locations, items, and concepts from the universe of Xenoblade 1 and describes them in detail. The locations also have the EXP, AP, and SP yields listed for every single discoverable place. I don't know why I would need to know this, but it's still very cool nonetheless. There's some stuff here that I didn't know myself, so I'll share some highlights. Armu milk is described as sour, but an utter delight. I guess you could say it's more of an utter delight. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very sorry. 
It also says that the milk is only at its best for 36 minutes and 9 seconds after milking an Armu. That must be a very difficult business to work in. Here it says that memory space is Zanza's memories. I know that some people have interpreted it as either Zanza's or Alvis's memories, but it seems to be the former's. Speaking of Alvis, he made his Claymore himself. Dixon also made Saber, but that's a lot less surprising considering he makes all sorts of weapons. The dome that you see around Colony 6 was actually built by the Mechon. The residents of the colony kept it because it could fend off aerial assaults. I never really thought about it, even though Atharon mentions it right here. The last thing in this section is a bit odd. It says that Zord is the faced Mechon that saved Juju during the Telethia assault on Colony 6. But... Zord is dead. Not only does he literally explode, Shulk and the others are fighting Zord's spirit at pretty much the same time. I would imagine, in order to have a spirit, you would have to be dead, right? The other spirits are. This might just be an oversight by the writers of the book. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think. The next section shows everyone's battle quotes, all possible heart-to-heart -heart branches, and all the dialogue you can get for accepting and rejecting quests. That's a lot of text. I'm just going to take a second to, again, thank all the translators on this project. You all did a fantastic job. The Character Design Works has a ton of concept art in it. It even has Fiora's beta design. You can see her here in the trailer for Monado Beginning of the World, which was Xenoblade's working title at the time. If you equip the dyed set, she'll look just like this, minus the long hair. Another Fiora costume I want to talk about is the speed frame. It's a classic Fiora look. According to this note, it's a favorite amongst the dev team. That's probably why we see it so much in the art book. McCall also has concept art here too. He originally used to have what looks like a pipe. I wonder why he doesn't have that in the final game. Because Dixon clearly smokes, so it's not like an age rating thing. There's also this really cool concept art of Zanza. He doesn't have official art, so it's super interesting to see him drawn out like this. Now we have the Mechanic Design Works, which has concept art and info for the faced Mechon. There's an interesting height schematic here for the face units. Wow, this makes it so much easier to see how Yaldabaoth towers over every other Mechon. It says here that Jade Face's design was made to resemble an insect. I guess I can see it? He's definitely more insect-like than the other faces. Definitely more than Nemesis. Fiora's face unit was meant to be, and I quote, sublime, feminine, harmonious, and balanced. Well, she definitely is very... symmetrical. Moving on, Yaldabaoth, or Goldface, or as the book refers to him, the Great Egil, has a very inspired design. Frankly, the book does a better job explaining it all than I ever would, so here you go. His body, surrounded by a golden aura, evokes that of Tutankhamun, Buddha, or Mandalas. The seven protrusions on his back resemble a Satoba, an epitaph panel for Buddhist funeral rites. His ominous mask alludes to a skull. For a design this complex, threatening, and massive, all of that is probably fitting. After the faces, there's a section with a ton of storyboards for the cutscenes. It's incredible to see the work they put in to make sure the cutscenes looked exactly the way they wanted. The detail in these is honestly immaculate. It makes me really want a Xenoblade manga or something like that. The next section is mainly filled with responses from polls from the popular Japanese magazine Dengeki. You could submit answers to the questions and all the responses to the polls are aggregated here. They ask things like, what's your favorite team composition? And if you lived in the world of Xenoblade, what species would you be? To which almost half of the people said Nopon. I don't know about all of you, but I'd want my Brog moment to last a Brog lifetime. They have a poll here that answers the age-old question, who is the best Xenoblade 1 girl? Sorry to all the Fiora stands and the six Charla simps, but Melia is officially the best grill. This is official Xenoblade media, people. You cannot argue with me. There are also a few little comics on the sides of the result pages. At the end of the section, there are pictures of a Ricky plush. The book actually comes with instructions on how to make the plush yourself, but I think the instructions are asking me to use the removable cover as a template to cut the fabric. My copy of the book is going nowhere near a pair of scissors, let me tell you that. 
And if you happen to completely miss the plot of the game, you can read up on it here in the event list. Interestingly, before Definitive Edition labeled parts of the story as chapters, the Monado Archives did. Along with the story recap are some development insights. Get ready to have your world turned upside down. Shulk Sandwich was not originally a sandwich. It was curry. That's why Fiora says she used special, special herbs, herbs and spices. spices. They decided to change it because a woman making curry is a sexist stereotype in Japan. Unfortunately, a woman making sandwiches is a sexist stereotype in other parts of the world. At least they tried to do the right thing. Right? They also share a very early draft of the story. Ryan, after losing his beloved Sharla, decides to go back to the past. But taking this course of action would lead to countless people losing their lives. Knowing this, Shulk opposes Ryan. The former uses the power of the Bionis, and the latter, the power of the Mechonis. The two of them fight to the death to defend their version of the future. I love the game we have already, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to see this concept play out, especially after knowing the characters as much as I do. Also, in an early draft was Ricky's original introduction. According to the dev team, Ricky was supposed to be a thief character. While the party was sleeping, Ricky was supposed to steal the Monado from under Shulk's nose and try and fight the Telethia with it. I don't know if I would even put something like that past Ricky now. Kojima also mentions that if it had not been for the Dunban and Ricky conversation on the fallen arm, they might have removed Ricky from the game. Although it's possible that he's joking. Of course, I can't leave all the horny folks hanging. I've got a fact about boobies for ya. Vinaya's boobies, to be specific. Even though Machina are completely mechanical beings, some eagle-eyed players will notice that Vinaya's breasts still bounce in cutscenes. The dev team joke that it's because her frame is spring-loaded. Is that the truth? Who knows? It's definitely pretty funny to me, though. This section is a special one. It's a part of the story involving Fiora that was removed from the final game, but it's written here instead. It takes place after Shulk wakes up and scares Dixon away from Colony 6. I won't say much more than that so I don't spoil you. Please go give the secret episode a read yourself if you haven't, especially if you're itching for new Xenoblade content. It's really cool. The next section is pretty interesting. It's a rough timeline of the major events surrounding the Bionis and the Mechonis. There are a lot of insights into the history of this world that I'll definitely get into in another video. The final section of the book is the credits for the game. Very fitting. Everyone that helped make the original Xenoblade happen is here. It's crazy that even more than 11 years later, we're still talking about this game. Even crazier for me is how I've spent almost half my time alive in love with this game. Seriously. Thank you, Monolith. Since we've gotten to the end of the book, that's going to be the end of the video. I plan on making more videos like this in the future, so if that interests you, click that subscribe button. With that, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!